All right, hold up. You're not going to want to miss this. I'm going to tell you exactly how our spring 2024 conference is going to go down. Here's the title of the conference, Blueprints for Christendom 2.0. Subtitle, Seven Doctrines for Ruling the World. We're going to have seven primary sessions covering each of these doctrines for ruling the world righteously. Number one, Reformed Confessionalism. That's going to be Pastor Doug Wilson preaching on that topic. Then we've got Covenant Theology with Pastor Brian So. Then we've got biblical patriarchy with Pastor Michael Foster. Then we've got presuppositionalism with Dr. Joseph Boot. Then we've got um, Kyperianism, all of Christ for all of life, where we're going to welcome Pastor Doug Wilson back for a second session. Then we've got general equity theonomy. We're going to have Dr. Joseph Boot come and do a second session on that topic. And then lastly, we'll have Pastor Dale Partridge on post-millennial eschatology. In addition to these seven sessions, we're all also going to have not one, but two live podcasts. On the first day of the conference, that's Friday, March 1st, we're going to have a live Theology Applied podcast. I'll be on the stage hosting the discussion with Douglas Wilson, Michael Foster, and Eric Kahn from It's Good to Be a Man. The topic is going to be all about biblical patriarchy. We're going to specifically be parsing out, distinguishing the biblical doctrinal differences between patriarchy and complementarianism. Again, that's Friday, March 1st, the first day of the conference, a live Theology Applied podcast on biblical patriarchy. Then we're going to have the next day, that's Saturday, March 2nd, a live Haunted Cosmos podcast. I'll be hosting this discussion with Brian Sauvé and Ben Garrett. We're going to be talking about the Nephilim. We're going to be talking about the Watchers. We're going to be talking about what creatures currently are living underneath the surface of the earth and chasms of the deep. It's going to be wacky. It's going to be weird, but it will also be thoroughly biblical and incredibly unhinged. So you're not going to want to miss these two live podcasts, Theology Applied on Friday, March 1st, the first day of the conference on biblical patriarchy with Doug Wilson, Michael Foster, Eric Kahn, and myself. And then the next day of the conference, Saturday, March 2nd, a live Haunted Cosmos podcast with Brian Sauvé and Ben Garrett and myself on the Nephilim, the Watchers, and what lies under uh, the surface of the earth. And then the conference will hold over for one final, the third and final day. That's going to be the Lord's Day, Sunday, March 3rd, where one of our speakers will be holding over to preach the Lord's Day sermon, and I'll be leading us in worship through the liturgy. So we've got three days, a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, March 1st, 2nd, and 3rd of 2024, Blueprints for Christendom 2.0, Seven Doctrines for Ruling the World. You're not going to want to miss this conference. Our early bird rate is still available but only for a very short period of time. We are ending the early bird rate on August 31st at 11.59 p.m. That will be the final chance to get into this conference at an affordable, cheap rate. All right, so go and take advantage of the early bird rate right now by going to rightresponseconference.com. Again, that's rightresponseconference.com to register for Blueprints for Christendom 2.0, March 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, 2024. Register today. So many of you are probably already aware of this, but I've been in a little bit of a debate lately online and offline and in pretty much every realm of my life about Christian nationalism. And I addressed some of that in my manifesto, for lack of a better label, uh, when we opened the conference yesterday afternoon. But I thought that it might be helpful to go through a little bit of my thinking on this and how it relates to post-millennialism, how it relates to general equity theonomy, talk a little bit about Christendom, talk about theocracy. Uh, One of the questions that I want to address this evening is top-down versus bottom-up. That's one of the questions that I've seen people asking. Uh, This post-millennial theonomic Christendom, um, is it just coercion? Is it just from the top uh, down, or is it from the bottom up? I think it's both, spoiler alert, but we will talk about that. So basically, my goal is, by God's grace, uh, to be really practical, to answer, I think, a lot of questions, uh, not just this is post-millennialism or this is uh, theonomy, but getting into a little bit of the weeds in terms of how these things might actually play out. That's my goal. I'm sure I'll do it imperfectly. But I'm going to try. So let's go ahead and start with prayer. Father God, I pray that you would uh, empower me by your spirit. uh, Lord, that you would grant me wisdom. 
that you would grant me grace, that you would use me uh, to the edification of your people, that I would be helpful and that we would grow, that we would be equipped and that we would be uh, better positioned uh, to live faithful lives of obedience out of love for Christ. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So I am a Christian nationalist. Why am I a Christian nationalist? Number one, because it's true. The way that I think about it is this, and you've heard other people say it, but I think they're right. I don't feel as though we really have a choice. Right? You, you have three primary categories and six total categories if you consider the fact that underneath each of these three primary categories, there are actually two subcategories. The three primary categories are as follows. Tribalism, nationalism, globalism. I'm not a globalist. I'm not a tribalist. I am a nationalist. Now, I understand some of the problems with the ism, as Dr. Boot was talking about. Isms are usually a bit dangerous. Femininity, wonderful. Feminism, terrible. Right? So isms usually come in and, and wreck things. Um, so if you want to get rid of the, the ism and just say, you know, Christian nationalist or an advocate for Christian nations, uh, that's fine. Uh, but I don't think there's any escaping this category of nations. Right, that it's not just being tribal, and it's certainly not a one-world order. Uh, I'm not a fan of Soros, right? So that that's not the direction that the Bible points towards. We see in Acts chapter 17 that nations are affirmed by God. They're good. They're His idea, and they're appointed by Him. Both their borders and their times. God causes nations to rise. He causes nations to fall, to be decimated. Nations, the Bible speaks of nations in terms of the nation that honors the Lord, that fears the Lord, will be exalted. And the nation that does not fear the Lord, but rebels against Him, will be brought low. It will be destroyed. So nations are God's idea. And I do believe that God, uh, He works in nations. He exalts them because of faithfulness to Christ. Not some abstract moral goodness that somehow separate from Christian goodness. There's only one kind of true goodness. Christ is the standard. His word is the standard. If it's not Christian, it's not moral. If it's not Christian, it's not moral. So nations that are moral, that are good nations, are nations that are Christian. And they're either explicitly Christian, which they should be. That's the best case scenario. But at worst, they might be moral in some aspects, in some regard, but still, while not explicitly acknowledging Christ, they're still at least borrowing from Christ. That's what Greg Bonson would say. You know, the atheist can only get up and debate a Christian apologist uh, by borrowing from the Christian's worldview. He assumes for a debate to even make sense that logic exists. And the atheist worldview can't account for logic. Why would there be laws of logic if all of creation isn't actually creation, but it's just physical matter that randomly came about over billions and billions of years, uh, just little lizard people crawling out of some kind of soup that eventually became this and eventually became that. Uh, th there, there is no logic to that. That's chaotic. And, and I think everyone in the room would agree with that. I think I'd be willing to bet pretty much everybody here is a six-day literal creationist. I said this during our Q&A, or at some point, but I said that I, there's, it's the same kind of principle, the same principle that we, that we heartedly receive and accept as Christians when it comes to creation, that God gradually and systematically, intentionally created the world. Not just in one moment, not even in one day, but over six days. He progressively creates the world and he distinguishes. He separates uh, night, right? Light from darkness. Uh, he separates land from water and then God fills, right? So he's, he's creating. He's uh, bringing uh, a sense of order to the chaos. The spirit is hovering, brooding above the waters. The earth is without form. It's void. God creates. Uh, then he, he distinguishes. He separates. 
right? He categorized orders and then he fills. He fills the land with beasts of the field. He fills the ocean. It's teeming with life and with fish. And God does all of this strategically, progressively, gradually. That is, in an eschatological framework, that is the post-millennial position. It's saying that he knows the end from the beginning. He's decreed it all, and it's all going to come about. But one of the things that God has decreed in this glorious plan from creation all the way to consummation is that Jesus will inherit as his reward for his obedience to the Father. His reward, his inheritance is nations. Nations are his inheritance. It's not just an abstract, monolithic world. It's not a one world order, but it's actually multiple different nations. And it's not just multiple different ethnicities in one world order without borders, because we have love in our hearts. No, it's multiple different political nations. It's, it's a, a politic. And they have borders, they have distinctions, they have governments, they have kings, they have rulers, whatever they may have. And this is the inheritance that Christ has. Uh, that this, he has bought this world by his blood. This is what the Father has promised to him. So Acts 17 says that God sets their borders and he sets nations' times. And so in that sense, I, I don't know how to get around the fact that we are, as Christians, if we have a Christian worldview, we believe in the innate goodness of God's plan of nations. So we are nationalist in that sense, certainly more than we are globalist and certainly more than we are tribalist. So the next question is, do you hold to Christian nations? or pagan nations. And I think this is part of the problem within evangelicalism is because we still have good brothers in Christ um, who think that there is a third option. They think that there's something in between Christian faithfulness and paganism. They think that there's neutrality. They have not yet fully come to terms, not consistently. They at least have not applied it all the way, the reality of neutrality being a myth. The myth of neutrality. Secularism, it's important that we understand secular humanism is merely a placeholder. And it was always meant to be a placeholder. Secularism is not a viable worldview. If we think in terms of hosts and parasites, secularism would be a parasite. It's not a host. It's not viable. A secularism only appears and only has the mere temporary optic of viability and strength so long as it's attached to a viable host. Uh, the host has been, for the last several hundred years, for this parasite of secularism, the host has been the Christian worldview. Christendom has been the host. And I think, in many ways, that's the reason why secularism has appeared and it's only a thin veneer, not in an objective sense. It does not work. But in terms of mere appearances, secularism has appeared to work not just for a few years or even a few decades. Secularism has appeared to be a viable, sustainable option for such a long time because as a, a parasite, it attached itself to such a viable host. There's no stronger host in all the universe than Christendom. There's no stronger host than the Christian worldview. And it wasn't just that secularism attached itself to Christendom after Christendom had had a 30-year reign, right? Or, or a 300-year reign. But very arguably, the case can be made that, that Christendom had a 1,500-year reign. If you start with Constantine, you can then start with King Alfred. That would be about a thousand years from now. And then certainly with England and the Covenanters and the Puritans and the founders with America. So no matter how you slice it, we're talking about centuries, not decades, certainly not years, but centuries. 500 would be the minimum time frame of Christendom, but I think easily could be argued in terms of 1500 years. So people will say, what's the problem? Well, what's the problem with classical liberalism? What's the problem? It's worked well. You, you're saying that this is a parasite, that it's not viable? How could something that's not viable work for 100 years? 
150 years, 200 years. Well, if it's coming on the heels of something that existed for 1,500 years, then even a 200-year-old parasite can still appear viable if it's attached and gaining its life source from a 1,500-year-old host, namely Chrysidum. So all that being said, one of the illustrations that I've used in the past is that Chrysidum and paganism, not secularism, hear me now, Chrysidum and paganism are like two massive ships. One is departing. It's leaving the docks, and that would be Chrysidum. The other is coming into port to replace it. That would be not secularism, but paganism. Now, these are old ships. Paganism, secularism is relatively new. Paganism is old. Chrysidum is old. Two very large ships and very old ships, and therefore, work with me with my illustration here, very slow ships. And there was a moment as Chrysidum is receding and paganism is coming in to take its place where these two ships in the night are passing by one another. And they didn't just pass by one another for 15 minutes, but arguably for 150 years. And as Christendom was on its way out, paganism on its way in, the tides receding with Christendom, and paganism, the old gods, Chris Wiley, Glenn Sunshine, some of those guys have talked about this, coming back in, it gave this momentary, a long moment, albeit, from our perspective of people who live approximately 70, 80, 90 years, it seemed long to us, multiple generations, but still momentary. In the big scheme of things, in human history, a very momentary optic, veneer, appearance of neutrality. Secularism. Secularism is viable. No, it, it only appears viable because paganism has not yet landed, not fully, and Christendom has not yet left, not fully. And because Christendom, we can still see it from the dock. Goodbye, Christendom. Please come back, Christendom. Because it's still in sight, we can still see it. We still have some of the supplies that it dropped off for us. We're still eating from that, living off of that. Uh, because Christendom is still within our sights. And paganism is within our sights as well, but is not fully landed. It gave this optic, this appearance that secularism was actually a viable, in fact, a very tolerant and compassionate and loving worldview. In fact, better than Christendom. The more humanitarian, the more kind, loving worldview. In fact, if Christians if they insist upon the Christian worldview and explicitly Christian nations instead of secular nations, then Christians are actually being jerks. They're actually being rude. Oh, why not just share religious freedom with others? Why, why not just carve out spaces for, for this thought and that ritual and this custom and that culture? Right? Principled pluralism. Principal pluralism brought you drag queen story hour. That's where that came from. That is cultus. That is worship. And that is the logical, inevitable end of secularism. Right back to ultimately the old gods of paganism. We often think of abortion and liken it to Molech. Right? Child sacrifice. And I think that that is an accurate correlation. A one correlation that is not made nearly as often um, is in terms of transgenderism and the Asherah poles. I believe it was Gehardus Voss, actually, who talked about this and said that the Asherah poles were once trees. Makes me think of Tolkien uh, and the the, you know, the uh, two towers and Eisenhower and, you know, it's very integral to uproot the trees, the old trees, bring them down, tear them down, right? Which ultimately is used to anger the ants, right? And the ants finally come in into battle. But, but trees were integral. 
the trees are, they represent fruitfulness. They represent life. They also represent uh, shelter, protection, right? This mustard seed that grows into a tree, the beasts of the field find shade and rest under it. The birds of the air are able to rest and perch in its branches. So trees, they, they not only provide a source of life and food from fruitfulness, but also shelter. It's provision and protection. You could argue both provision from its fruit and protection from its shade. Trees are life-giving. Well, the Asherah pole were once trees, but they were stripped of all their branches, of all their leaves, of all their fruit, stripped down into androgynous, same, bland, naked poles. And those are two of the sacraments that we find in our culture today. And the sacrament, it is worship, it is a religion. The sacrament of child sacrifice and abortion, think Molech, but also the sacrament of transgenderism, I think Asherah poles, fruitlessness, androgyny, dead, lifeless, naked, bare. Now these, in one sense we could argue, are the logical and inevitable end of secularism. In the other sense, though, we could also argue that these are very, very similar, if not exact, with old forms of paganism. Is transgenderism, is abortion, are these kinds of things, sexual confusion, androgyny, uh, feminism, goddess worship, Worshipping women. Are, are these things merely, this is the question that I'm asking, are they merely the logical end of a secular humanist worldview? Or are they actually the introduction, the reintroduction of old pagan views? Is it a coincidence, right? Because, because that's the excuse, that's the answer, that's the response that's always given is, we were joking. We're just joking. You Christians, you just, you're so serious. You make everything religious. Really? Because there's a certain point where it's like, this is, there are so many coincidences that I think there might be something of substance here. Is it just a coincidence that the Grammys or the Oscars or whatever it was, this satanic performance, is it just a coincidence that you actually have, you know, you're tearing down statues of the founders but erecting statues of old pagan gods. Right? We've moved past religion. We're superior to, to Neanderthal, primitive people that still need a god. Okay, it, well, science has replaced that, sure. That's what you say. Neutrality has replaced it, sure, that's what you say. But then how come the further we go down this road of secularism, the more religious you become? You're saying secularism was always meant to just replace religion because it holds you back, because it's intolerant, because it's divisive. But, but we bought, and when I say we, I mean the evangelical church. Over decades now, we bought that lie. We chose to play ball. But what has happened is not just the removal of Christian religions, but their replacement with false religions. Minneapolis now has a public call to Islamic prayer. In American city, five times a day, sirens playing in the city. We, you gotta, you gotta carve out a spot for the Muslim. Right? Principled pluralism. For the record, some people have asked me, you know, would, would, would a Christian nation, particularly America, require that, that we get rid of the Constitution? What about the very First Amendment, the freedom of religion? My position is that no. Uh, but what it would require, we would not have to get rid of the Constitution. But what it would require is that we become true constitutionalists in the sense that we get back to authorial intent, that the Constitution is not a living document. It doesn't evolve and change with each generation. The founders, they, they were not saying freedom of religion to mean, you know, we just really hope one day our great, great, great grandchildren will have Muslim sirens five times a day in their city. That was not even on their radar. When they say freedom of religion, what they're talking about is 
denominational battles within the Christian faith. They're talking about carving out a spot for multiple different expressions, not of other religions, but the one true religion, the Christian religion, without being at each other's throats. It's what Dr. White has, has mentioned being concerned about. Right? Dr. White is saying, you know what? I am post-millennial. I am theonomic. I still don't really like this word Christendom because I'm a Baptist and Presbyterians weren't really nice to Baptist. Right? So we do need to figure that out. That's, I believe, what the founders had in mind in terms of freedom of religion. Not false religion, but different expressions of, of worship with our one common Lord is some of the language that is used even in the Westminster and other early documents. So, no, I don't think that the Constitution would have to be rewritten. One word real quick on just Presbyterians persecuting Baptists. That shows you just how deep the loser theology goes for Baptists. Think about this. There are 10 times as many Baptists in our nation than Presbyterians. And we still think that if we had a Christian nation, that Baptists would be the ones who are persecuted. <laughs> Baptists have been committed to loser theology for so long, even when we outnumber our brothers across the aisle, 10 to one, we think if we became a Christian nation, there's 10 times as many of us as there are of them, and we would be in cages. Baptists are just fiercely committed to losing. Um, I would like to think that nobody will be in cages. If anyone was, it'd be the Presbyterians. We've got them outnumbered. So uh, you can tell Dr. White, we don't have to be, we don't have to be as worried. We, we've got the numbers on our side. But he's right in the sense that we, yeah, we need to figure these things out. And that's why I appreciate guys like Doug Wilson saying that, that what we're advocating for is not a return to Christendom 1.0, uh, but it's Learning from Christendom 1.0, which surely would be a radical improvement from secular humanism, quickly returning outright paganism. So it's certainly better than what we currently have. But ideally, what we're rooting for, what we're working towards is not Christendom 1.0, but Christendom 2.0. We're working towards being able to say that there were really great things and the things that weren't great about Christendom in the past we're willing to say that those were bugs rather than features. The features were good. And sure, there were bugs, but we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. So we are not tribalists. We are not globalists. We are nationalists. And I see no other alternative but to be Christian nationalist. It's either Christian nationalist or anti-Christian nationalist. Jesus himself said, a man is either for me or against me. There is no neutral ground. And everything that has appeared in our recent history, and it is recent, by the way, in the big scheme of things, everything in our recent history that has appeared as being neutral, a third option, is really only two diametrically opposed forms of worship slowly passing each other by in the night. There's not a third option. There's just option one and option two, Christ and chaos, and that brief moment as they're switching places. That's what makes you think there's neutrality. That is only a moment. Christ departs even further, or rather we apostatize from Christ even further. Paganism comes into port and actually lands, and you quickly discover that principal pluralism is an illusion. It's a lie. There's no such thing. Principled pluralism, for the record, is simply a euphemism for polytheism. That's all pluralism is. It's polytheism. It is carving out a space for the worship of many gods. Hear, O Israel, your God is one. When we carve out a space for many gods rather than only one God, then we are committing ourselves to the worship of false gods. There is only one God who is the true God. If we worship as a nation, as a body politic, more than one God, then you have committed yourself to the worship of many false gods. So I see no way around Christian nations. And therefore, we all, as Christians, must be, you don't have to say Christian nationalism, you can change the language, you can be strategic, you can be careful, that's fine. 
But at minimum, you have to be able to at least say this. As a Christian, I am an advocate, a proponent of seen Christian nations. Maybe not Christian nationalism because I don't like the ism. I get it. But I am a proponent. I am a proud advocate of nations being Christian because the nations are Christ's inheritance. And we see that all throughout Scripture. So why am I a Christian nationalist? Because it's true. And it seems to be the only option. But number two, because it's ecumenical, which is a scary word also. Ecumenical can be good. It can go too far and be bad. But I mean it in this sense. It's ecumenical in the sense that I believe it provides a big tent, or I would argue many different tents, to work together with brothers and sisters in Christ who don't necessarily hold to all the particular theological convictions that I do. There are many people right now, so I'm speaking, I'm getting you know, practical here and personal here. I am still in the Baptist world. I'm still a, a card-carrying Baptist, at least to some degree. Somebody uh, posted a meme, it was really funny, where I said, you know, as a Baptist, you should be thinking in these terms. And I say this as a Baptist. And somebody uh, posted like some, some meme that uh, said, uh, does anybody believe him at this point? Right? They said, um, and it was like a meme of uh, some, I don't know, some actor that was clearly like 50 years old and he's wearing his hat backwards and he's sagging his, his jean shorts and he's walking down um, a hallway in a high school by the lockers and he says, hello, fellow students. And he's like, that's what Joel Webman's doing when he says, hello, fellow Baptist. It's like, nobody believes you, dude. Nobody believes you. I am a Baptist. I am still currently a Baptist. I plan on staying a Baptist. But one of the things that Wilson said in his blog and May blog recent, that time Virginia flogged a Baptist. Did you guys read that one? It's really helpful. He ended with, with saying this. Either Baptists need to do the work they need to be able to carve out a, theolog a theological framework from a Baptist perspective for engaging culture and changing the culture and working towards Christian nations, a Christian nationalist in that sense, an advocate of working towards Christian nations. So Baptists either need to do the theological work for why a Baptist can do those things, or, or you need to leave off being a Baptist. Stop being a Baptist. And he finished with this line. He said, because at the end of the day, you should care more about stopping the murder of children than stopping the baptism of children. And that's a good word for some of our Baptist brothers. Like, what is more important to you? Seeing babies not baptized or seeing babies not chopped up into pieces. Now, in Doug Wilson's defense, he's saying he's pretty ecumenical. I, that's part of the reason why people hate Doug Wilson, because they think he's too ecumenical. But he's saying there is a third option that Baptists could do the work. Right? So you don't just have to be a Baptist who's a pietist and doesn't care about winning the culture of the Christ whatsoever. And you don't have to be a Presbyterian. Who cares about culture? You could be a Baptist who cares about culture. Do the work. And that's why I'm choosing to partner with other guys, writing, you know, and editing statements like the statement on Christian nationalism and the gospel. The font could use some work. <laughs> but I'm committed to these kinds of things because here's the thing, back to, you know, C point A, previous point that I made, there are 10 times as many Baptists as Presbyterians. And part of my thinking in this moment, and I admit, it's strategic, it is pragmatic. Ultimately, the conviction must be exegetical, I'm aware. With that, that disclaimer having been made now, in a strategic mindset, I'm thinking, can I convince more Baptists to work towards Christian nations than I can convince Baptists to become Presbyterians? And I think to my Presbyterian brothers and sisters in the room, 
I'll try not to give the Baptist too hard of a time. And you guys are usually good sports. You, you usually, it seems like, at least for the most part, it's in jest. I at least always feel that way. I feel like you guys are kind towards me. But keep pushing us. Keep pushing us. But here's the thing. Push us to be Presbyterian because that's your conviction. That's your conviction. And so be honest about that. that you don't have to apologize for that. If that's your conviction, you see it in the scripture, then, then tell Baptists you think they're wrong. That's okay. We're allowed to say that. We're allowed. To, we must be able to disagree and say those things. So do that. Praise God for that. But even more than that, even more than pushing Baptists to become Presbyterian, I encourage you to push Baptists to stop being pietist. So more than trying to get Baptists to be Presbyterian, first, let's really get Baptists to stop being pietist. And I think that biblically, and I've been working on it, but I think biblically that the exegesis is there and that Baptists actually can have a solid political theology. I think that with guys like John Gill, Benjamin Keach, Nehemiah Cox, old Baptist, recent Baptists are no help at all, but old Baptists, I think that you can have an engaging, culture-shaping, Christian nation-forming Baptist theology. And yes, you can call nations Christian as a Baptist. Everybody knows that we're not saying each and every individual person in the entire nation is regenerate. That is silly. We need to stop being silly. So I think that the work can be done. Will it be as robust as the Black Robe Regiment? Will the Baptist political theology 100 years from now be a contender and a peer to the Westminster side of things? Probably not. <laughs> Probably not. Maybe. But again, Baptists need a home. And I don't want to just say, it's, it's, this is another illustration I've used. It seems like Presbyterians are over here on this plot of land. It's a nice plot of land, and they've got a great old Victorian house. And then Baptists, we picked a plot of land, and we picked it like hundreds of years ago. And we love it. And we're committed to it. And there's even a foundation there. But for like four or five hundred years, nobody thought to actually build a house. Right? So, so we own our land... It's beautiful land with a beautiful foundation, but we don't have that political theology. And so then what happens is as guys start to see what's missing, they go ahead and switch up. They move to Moscow. And I'm sympathetic. I get it. I get the temptation. But there's work that I believe can be done. It won't be done the same way. Our covenant theology is different. That's true. But absolutely, within a biblical and baptistic framework, seeing nations... Worship King Jesus in a collective sense, I believe, falls well within the boundaries of Reformed Baptist 1689 federalism or covenant theology. So that's the goal. So why am I saying I think I am a Christian nationalist? One, because I don't see any other option. And I understand, again, I'm not saying you have to use the term, but you get what I'm saying. Either pagan nationalist or Christian nationalist. I'm not a tribalist, I'm not a globalist. So I'm about Christian nations. I think it's true. Number two, I think it's ecumenical. I want to help my Baptist brothers and sisters engage politics and not just switch teams and convince, you know, 14 of them to switch with me while the rest remain Baptist and unengaged Baptist. So if the dispensationalist want to prove that post-millennials have been right all along, about our eschatology by joining us in the fight and working towards Christian culture and Christian nations, come along. God bless you. I'll partner with a dispensationalist. But doctrine will always still matter. Doctrine will always matter. We're going to have the argument. We must have the argument. We must come to conclusions, not just philosophically or pragmatically, but exegetically. And as Dr. White said earlier today, for the record, Hebrews 8 is one of the biggest reasons why I'm still a Baptist. And I know you guys could probably, you know, Joel, if I could just have 15 minutes with you, I'd set you straight. Well, I, a lot of people have spent more than 15 minutes with me and I haven't been set straight yet, which means the arguments are bad or I'm very dense and I know that the latter is possible. 
But all that being said, John chapter 8 is a profound argument. And in my assessment, at least as it stands, the new covenant is not just bigger, but better. And it's not just wider in its scope, but deeper in its promises. It's actually founded upon better promises. And not just the promises of the law being written on your hearts, because that is true. But because the law was always written on the hearts of men, even pagan men, those who aren't regenerate, it was written on Adam's heart. Ten commandments, moral commandments given to Adam, written on the heart with one positive precept. In addition, that he not eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So all the way from our first parents, Adam and Eve, you have the law written on their hearts. But in the new covenant, Ezekiel 36, it's the law intensified upon the heart for the Christian the conscience sharpened, the Holy Spirit bringing conviction of sin, guiding them into all truth. But it's not even just that. It's not even just the law written on the heart, then the law magnified by the Spirit. But the Bible says, I will cause you to walk in my ways. And I will put my fear, the fear of myself, within you. I will actually put the fear of myself within you. And I will cause you to walk in my ways. Not just I will put my ways on your heart so that they're clearly seen. And then intensify them even more so they're more clearly seen. But I'll actually work it out for you. I will actually cause you to walk in my ways. And I will put the fear of myself within you. You cross-reference that with other texts like Romans chapter 3. With the wicked, there is no fear of God. It's not that they have not enough fear of God before their eyes or less fear of God. But there is no fear of God before their eyes. So I'm just, I'm trying to garnish a little sympathy and just saying, I, here, here I stand, I can do no other. And so, Baptists need to get in the game. We need to get in the game. And I think we can. I absolutely believe that biblically, this is something that is possible. Now, all that being said, big tent, ecumenical, I feel as though also, no, it's not whether but which. We're either Christian nationalists or pagan nationalists. We've already covered that. But doctrine still matters, and even though we can be ecumenical, and we can partner with somebody who's dispensational, we can partner with, uh, with Westminster and Pado, you know, infant baptism and credo baptism, uh, we could even partner, I believe, at some level, we can still partner, whether it's Kuyperian or somebody who has a, a, a classic two-kingdom theology, but eventually these debates will have to be had, and I think they need to be had now, because they're going to be long debates. They're going to have to be had again and again and again. And one of the problems that I'm already detecting from my Baptist brothers on the Christianist, Christian nationalist side of things is that a lot of them are not theonomist. Not even a general equity theonomy. Nothing. Nothing. Um, they, are, they are Thomist. They put a heavy emphasis on natural theology and the reason of man, man's reason. They think that that's enough. Uh, man was created in the image of God, and despite the fall, a vestige of the enemy, uh, the, a vestige of the image of God still remains. But that image, although remaining, has been thoroughly tarnished. That's the doctrine of total, not utter, but total depravity. That we still maintain the image of God, but there's not one part of it that hasn't been marred by sin. Especially, not just including, but especially including man's ability to reason. So does God have two books, in a sense, in which he has spoken? Has God spoken in special revelation? Has God also spoken in natural revelation? Does he declare something about himself in the world that he has made? Yes. The problem is that that book of natural revelation, fallen man is not good at reading. Because of total depravity, man's reason is so marred that even though God has spoken in natural revelation, fallen man is illiterate, so to speak. And can he somehow fumble along and arrive at certain truths? Sure, sure. But even that, I, I want you just to consider this. I'm throwing out some hypotheticals here. Some, some of this is it just, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if this, if this is definitively true. I, I'm just, how I've been thinking about this. 
over the past few months. I wonder if even unregenerate man, in because nobody's thinking or doing theology or doing astrophysics or doing engineering or this or that, nobody's doing anything in a vacuum. We all, within the province of God, are in a particular context, in a particular time, in a particular place. Don't you think at least it's possible that unregenerate people, unbelievers, would be able to, to make greater innovations, inventions, and discoveries if the context, nobody's doing it in a vacuum, if the context in which this atheist is, is working in the sciences and working in physics is on the heels of 1,500 years of Christendom? Right, because that's part of the temptation, I think, right now. That's one of the reasons why we, we give too much credence to classical liberalism. And we give too much credence, it, it, this plays in with Thomism. We give too much credence to man's reason, unregenerate man's reason. I think unregenerate man reasons better in Christendom. But what would, I was talking about this with, with one of the members of my church, a friend, uh, Wes, who's here tonight. Elon Musk. He does some scary things, but he also does some good things. But even if he had the exact IQ, the exact personality, the exact intellect, but he was born before, you know, in Japan, before the 13th century, would he be making rocket ships? Or would he be like a samurai warlord, raping and pillaging people? Right? We've had genius genius pagans before. You see, the genius pagans that we have today do some wonderful things. One, because they're made in the image of God. But two, because this is an image bearer, the image tarnished, but the image is still there, a vestige of the image remains, and it's an image bearer, not in a vacuum, but immersed, that's a Baptist pun, by the way, immersed in the Christian worldview, on, on the heels of centuries of Christian thought, Christian architecture, Christian art, Christian painting, Christian thinking, Christian science. Elon Musk is assuming all of that. He was born into it. That's why the, the, the Titan intellect, who is not regenerate, is able to do so many wonderful things. We, we all know there's one reason why. One reason is because even the unbeliever was created in the image of God. But I'm proposing a second reason. That the unbeliever, with a Titan intellect, created in the image of God, but still unregenerate, an unbeliever, he doesn't just do wonderful things because he has God's image. But that unbeliever with God's image does especially wonderful things when providentially he's born into Christian nations with Christian assumptions and Christian systems of thought. But what happens if Christendom leaves? The thing that Baptists don't even believe exists, Christendom. What happens if it leaves? And I mean fully leaves, not just the two ships passing in the night. But what if Christendom gets so far away we can't even see it anymore? And this illusion, the parasite of secularism, actually kills the host. And if you know anything about hosts and parasites, once the host is dead, the parasite dies too. And the host that will replace Christendom is paganism. Did you know, Christian, the Christian worldview is not the only host in terms of worldview. Christianity is not the only host. It's the only indefinitely viable host. It's the best host, the superior host. But there are other hosts. Now, not ironic at all, totally makes sense. Other hosts, the thing that makes them at least somewhat viable is they steal from Christianity. So two Christian heresies, Islam and Judaism. They are viable, not as viable, as Christianity, but they are viable because they're Christian heresies. Judaism is a Christian heresy. It's not half of the Christian faith. It's half of the Christian faith, the Torah, then misinterpreted through the Talmud and perverted and twisted and therefore a Christian heresy. Islam is a Christian heresy, but there's still some, you know, 
remnants of Christian thought within it, like, for instance, marriage is between a man and a woman, and it's good to have kids. Right? Well, that gives you some viability. You've got some staying power. Secularism is a parasite because it denies even that. It denies God's goodness and the distinction between men and women. It denies the goodness of being fruitful and multiplying. That's why secularism doesn't have any lasting power. That's why secularism is not what will replace Christianity. Secularism may kill Christendom for a time, but what will replace it will be something else. Not, not secularism, but something else. Maybe it's Islam, maybe it's Judaism. My bet, again, is on paganism, at least for many parts in the West. So, we need a big tent. We need to be ecumenical. We need to partner together. However, we also still need to disagree along the way. So I'll participate in a statement like the statement on Christian nationalism in the gospel. But then I'll also, less than a week later, host the Theonomy and Postmillennialism Conference. So that all my Baptist brothers who are fighting for Christian nations, so that they know I'm with you under the big tent. But I live in a particular strain. Theonomy and postmillennialism. I, I am working towards Christian nations, but I am not doing it on the foundation of man's reason. I'm not doing it with a pessimistic eschatology. I'm doing it with Christ and a great postmillennial hope, and I'm doing it by Christ, namely by His law word, His precepts, His commandments, in Scripture. In Scripture. The easiest way that I can say it in terms of presuppositional and Thomism and these kinds of things, what I tell people all the time is, you know, I'm presuppositional, and the short version is this. I believe God wrote a book, and we're allowed to use the book. In fact, we're not only permitted, we must use the book. And you can appeal to other authorities, because the book says there are other authorities, but they're all lesser authorities. That's what makes you ultimately, at the end of the day, presuppositional, is that the final authority is this. You don't say, because of the authority of logic, we can trust the Bible. Because of the authority of sense perception, and because my senses are reliable, we can therefore trust the Bible. Because of this certain, you know, archaeologist who discovered this over here, therefore we can trust the resurrection, which ultimately gets us to Jesus being God, and then he says that the Bible is the Bible, so now we can trust the Bible. No, what makes you presuppositional is not that you just say, well, Romans 1, Romans 1, Romans 1. You can appeal to other authorities, but all of them resting on the final authority. It's what's, what's underneath. What's the final authority? The Bible validates all these other authorities. These other authorities do not validate the Bible. The Bible is self, self-authenticating. And I believe that ultimately that's the only view that's going to last. Because anything other than that that makes the Bible ultimately dependent on man's reason or anything else will eventually get us right back to the Enlightenment and right back to secularism. So partner as much as we can with anyone. I, I want people to leave this conference not with a sense of theological pride or superiority. Going back, if you're not post-mill, my pastor's not post-mill, so I'm immediately leaving my church. I, I don't want that to be the takeaway. I want the takeaway to be, look, we want to see the nations praise King Jesus. That they would flow to Jesus. And we know that this is a, a long project, a long period, but we can partner with other Christians that don't hold the exact same convictions and theologies as we do, and we're going to work with them, we're going to be humble, but we're also going to argue along the way. Not a divisive kind of arguing, a humble arguing, but also not, we're not relativist. We don't pretend that these things don't matter. So Christian nationalism, I think it's a big tent, I think it's a label. It's up to you and your conscience. I'm not telling you what to do. But I think it's a label worth wearing. And it allows us to partner with other Christians to change our nation, to work towards that over time. But at the same time, we have to be able to say to those Christians, I'm with you here. But you need to switch what you believe over there. This is going to be a problem. So that's the Christian nationalism thing. Why am I committed to Christendom 2.0? And I'll land the plane 
Very quickly, why am I committed to Christendom 2.0? Well, because we're not going to convince others to join us in this project if we're dishonest about the failures of the last project. So you may not agree with this or agree with that. Well, I don't think that this is a real term or I don't think that's a real... No, well, here's what we know for sure. There have been many serious abuses in the name of Christ. So how is it persuasive? How is it persuasive to say um, Christendom had no bugs, only free features? The Spanish Inquisition is a myth and it never happened. That, that's not persuasive. It's, it's actually far easier, right? Thinking again, I, I think in terms of winning, which is a very, it's, that's, a, that's a novel way for a Baptist to think, but I, I think in terms of winning, so I think, what would persuade? What, what would be reasonable? What could I get someone on board with? Okay, so, so what's more persuasive? To convince someone that Christendom 1.0 had no abuses? Or to convince someone that Christendom doesn't have to be done that way again? That Christendom is good, and that even Christendom 1.0 is better than secular humanism and 65 million murdered babies, so to say, it's not whether but which. Even Christendom 1.0 is better than what we currently have. But here's the good news. We're not even saying let's switch secularism for Christendom 1.0. We're saying let's switch secularism for Christendom 2.0. And one of the ways that we do that is with a separation of church and state. And this is, again, some of the confusion. That people are like, you know, well, you're arguing for, you know, a, a conflation of church and state. We've said it multiple times during the conference. I'm going to say it again so that you remember. Remember this. If anyone says, you want, you Christian nationalists, you theonomists, you post-mill guys, you want to conflate the state and the church. Say, no, 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 no. Um, we are not proponents of an ecclesiocracy. That is a, a, a church-run state. We are not proponents of an ecclesiocracy. But we are proponents of theocracy. Theocracy. So we don't want a church-run state, ecclesiocracy, folding those two sovereign spheres, church and state, together. But we are proponents of theocracy, which is not church conflating into state, but it's Christ ruling over state. Separation of church and state, yes. And I think you can biblically argue that. It's not just, oh, it's a good idea, and that, but that comes from our American tradition. No, I think you can biblically argue it. Rod Martin, he says, you know, that even in Genesis, you see that the scepter is given to Judah, but the priesthood is given to Levi. So even with the 12 tribes of Israel, you don't have the ruling power and the Levitical priestly power within the same tribe. There is a distinction, but still both in Israel. So separation of church and state, yes and amen. I think it's biblical, I think it's right, and I think it's one of the ways that you guard against Christendom 2.0 having the same abuses of Christendom 1.0. So assuage people's fears. Don't convince them that Christendom's never done any wrong. Don't pretend. Be honest about that and say, yeah, but even that, number one, even that would be better than what we currently have. You should be able to get agreement on that if you're talking with a Christian. And then number two, we're not even saying go back to that. We're saying go to this and work that out. And one of the ways that we work out the bugs of Christendom 1.0, as we usher in Christendom 2.0, is a separation of church and state. No ecclesiocracy. However, no ecclesiocracy. Yes, inevitably, a theocracy. Theocracy means no separation of Christ and state. Separation of church and state? Yes. Separation of Christ and state? No, every government has a God. Again, not whether but which. And if it has no God above it, then the government itself is God. The state is God, which again is a religion. It's a form of worship. It's statism. So it's inevitable. It's not whether but which. It's not will there be a God in government. It's simply what God will there be. So we're committed to theocracy. The last question is this. Does God change his uh, world from the top down or from the bottom up? 
We need more regenerate hearts. We need a great move of the Spirit of God that may come in our lifetime. We work towards it. We pray for it. But it also may not come. God is sovereign and He does what He wills. We need a great move of the Spirit. We need more conversion. We need more regenerate hearts. And then we need those Christians with numbers, greater numbers than we currently have, to apply all of Christ to all of life. To not just be Christians in the church and in their marriages and their parenting and the home and the church, but to be Christians in every single realm of society. Christian in vocation, Christian in the arts and entertainment and media, and certainly in the civil magistrate. We need young Christian men not just to go to seminary to be pastors. We need young Christian men to actually want to be politicians, as ugly as it might sound. I believe it was Vody Bauckham who said this. He said, you know, one of the problems is that any time a church has a young man who has an interest and a desire and some gifting for theology, the church can't help itself. I mean, just not even the pastor of the church, but just members of the church. And they all are well-intended. They're not trying to do anything harmful, but they, they, they just tell that young man, the Lord must have called you to be a pastor. Because we can't even fathom the category of a, a young man who loves theology, but isn't called to be a pastor. Do you know what you're, you're, sub, what you're, what you're doing right there? You're basically saying that, uh, that Christians who aren't called a vocational ministry don't really need to be good at theology. And, and that's what we've done. We've done that for decades with young men, is we'll find young men who are successful. They're gifted, they're ambitious, they're intelligent, and they're godly. They love the Lord. And we found them as doctors. We found them in media. We found them in business. And what do we do with them? We tell them, you should sell your business. You should quit your medical profession. And you should go to seminary and be a pastor. And now we say, Christians don't have any institutional power. We lost all our institutions. Yeah, you took your best guys out of them. You took your most talented guys in those institutions and you told them if they really loved Jesus, they'd be pastors. Because at the end of the day, in your heart of hearts, what you actually believe is that the only institution that matters is the church. And that has been the dominant Baptist assumption for quite a while. And I believe it's wrong. I believe it's wrong. The church, as Joe Boot said, the ecclesia, the called out ones, as it represents individual people who make up Christ's bride, yeah, that's uh, nothing compares to that. But the church institute, the institution of the church, while radically important and vital, it is not the only thing that's important. It does not have exclusive importance. Medicine matters. The home matters. The arts matter. Academia matters. And the civil magistrate, Caesar, he matters. Did you know John Gill, a Baptist, I might add, John Gill said this. He, and he's referencing, cross-referencing over, this is in Joshua chapter, I believe it's chapter 1 verse 11, his commentary. He's cross-referencing over to 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. It says, he who desires to be an elder, an overseer, a pastor, desires a noble thing. And he says, in the same way that desiring the office of an elder in the church is a noble desire, so too he who desires to be an officer in the state desires a noble thing. That's John Gill's position on Christians in the civil magistrate. Because he's talking about Joshua's officers. He gives the command to the officers, and then the officers go and tell the people. The less, it's the doctrine of the lesser magistrate. He's saying this is a noble thing as well. And that Joshua would not have gotten very far if it wasn't for having lesser magistrates, godly officers, to help him corral and lead the people. We need Christian men who are serious about theology, who want to do something besides just pastor. We need pastors. We need that too. But that's not all we need. 
It's not all that we need. So we need more regenerate hearts. We need more gospel preaching. We need more churches planted. But we also need more Christians involved in other spheres of society at large besides just the church institute. And all of that is bottom up. But my conclusion for today is this. The sodomites with less than 3% of the population in 40 years replaced the American flag with a rainbow. I'll say it one more time. The sodomites with less than 3% of the population in a matter of four to five decades tops effectively replaced our national flag, effectively, with a rainbow. They did not have the numbers. They did not have the numbers, but man, were they influential. And so I think it's both. Not in a tyrannical sense, not, not, not being domineering, not being ungodly. You, you do all this righteously. But the reason why I think we have to have the conversation is one, because I think it's not either or, I think it's both, both and. It's bottom up, massive move of the Spirit, massive regeneration. We need more regenerate hearts. But two, the regenerate hearts that we already have need to get in the fight. They need to be educated. They need to be equipped. They need to engage. And we need to have an understanding of these things right now because right now, even if we don't have the numbers, even if we are the minority in this current moment in history, right now there are Christian Christians who are police officers. And they're asking us, how should we then live? There are Christians who are city council members asking the question, how should we then live? There are Christian mayors now not just 500 years from now with Christendom 2.0. There are Christian mayors now, Christian council members now, Christian officers now. There, my point is there are Christians in the civil magistrate right now asking the question, how do I behave as a Christian in civil government? And we have to have a theology for that. Even all the way back, way before Christendom was established. In the very beginning, the grassroots, when, when the Christians were far outnumbered, in the days of John the Baptist, even then, civil magistrates from Rome, soldiers came to him and said, what should we do? And John the Baptist had an answer. And his answer wasn't, oh, you're, you're, you're going to you're repent and be baptized? Well, the Christian thing to do for those who repent and are baptized is you quit your civil magistrate job. Stop being a soldier. That's not what he said. John the Baptist effectively, this is the essence, the conclusion of what he said, is he said, you can be a Christian and work within the civil magistrate. But you have to be, if you're a Christian, you have to work in the civil magistrate Christianly. Christianly. And so we have to be able to give an answer. We have to be able to say, this is what it's like today, not just 500 years from now, but right now. How does a Christian use equal weights and measures? How are they impartial and blind when it comes to justice? How are they proportional, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, life for life? That's why general equity, theonomy, and these kinds of conversations, they matter. Not just that they matter for the 500-year plan, but they also matter for the five-year plan. And we need to be committed to both. Let's pray. Father God, thank you. Thank you for the truth. That you, th thank you for not abandoning us. Jesus said, I will not leave you as orphans, but I will come to you. And Christ has come to us. The spirit of the risen Christ has come to us who are in Christ through faith by the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit. Our body is now a temple of the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit reminds us of all that Christ has said and guides us into truth and convicts us of sin. And the Holy Spirit doesn't just do this to inform us of how to walk out our 15-minute daily quiet time. But you are guiding us into all truth, leading us and reminding us of the words of Christ so that we may live them out in every sphere of life, even in the sphere of the state. So, Father, help us, Lord. Help us to believe that your word is sufficient. 
so much of this conversation simply comes down to the sufficiency of Scripture. Do we believe that the Word is sufficient for all of life and godliness? Life is quite the category. It's a big banner, life. Surely life includes civil life, political life. Help us to believe that your Word is not just sufficient in its ability to teach us of salvation and how to go to heaven when we die. That is vitally important. But help us to believe that your word speaks to everything. As Dr. Boots said, even stir fry or how to boil an egg. And if your word does address even Christian cooking, and there is such a thing, then certainly it addresses Christian governing. And help us as Christians to have an answer. An answer from the scripture that doesn't say murder should be illegal. Theft should be illegal, but these other things aren't, and it's because at the end of the day, the standard is it seems right, or it's just what we've done ever since I've been alive in America. Now, we need to be able to point to the Bible. And when someone says, well, you're pointing to these verses, why not those? Then we need to be able to confess that we're being hypocritical and that God's standard is actually not just just but it's also compassionate. It is compassionate. As Joe said last night, prison is not compassionate. It's not humane. We are so deceived and so warped. We need your help. So God, we do pray. Right now, I pray for a massive move of your spirit, that there would be revival and regeneration across our land and our nation and all over the world. We pray for it, Lord. We plead with you that you might turn the hearts of the people back to you. But Lord, we also pray that as we wait for that, that Christians now, saved by your grace today, that we would be faithful in every realm and that we would seek to apply all of Christ to all of life. And not just speaking in the hypothetical for 500 years from now, but what we're going to do on Monday. Help us, God. It's a massive project. It's going to require massive wisdom, learning, and humility. Help us to be humble, Lord. Help us to work with those we disagree with as much as we can, but also while maintaining that doctrine matters. We pray it all in Jesus' name. It's a tall order, but you are a faithful God. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we'll see you guys tomorrow morning for the Lord's Day, 10 a.m.